Jess, and I'm the Faith Formation and Community Coordinator here. And we just want each of you to know that we're glad you're here today, and we're looking forward to celebrating Pentecost together. And we also think it's an important thing here at The Road in alignment with our values of wonder, justness, genuineness. Which one am I missing? They're on the banners. <laughs> wonder, genuineness, justness, and openness. There we go. In line with our values at the road, we want to make sure that our welcome is very clear and um, expansive because our Father's welcome is so expansive. So um, you are welcome here uh, no matter your race, ethnicity, your ability level, your gender identity or expression, your sexuality, your economic status, your politics, whether you're feeling low this morning or hyper or somewhere in the middle, um, you are welcome here. And um, it is uh, National Indi Indigenous History Month. So if we could just move to the next slide, because I forgot my notes at home, but the slides are here. So I thought we could start with this um, Ho'odono'oni. I looked up how to pronounce this word, so it's Ho'odono'oni. Ho'odono'oni. So that group of people is from Eastern Canada, and it was an amalgamation of five groups of people. And another name um, would be Iroquois, might be the name that you've heard. So it's people who are building the log house. Um, and, but the, I, I saw on YouTube that Iroquois is, I should stand over here more, better for the Zoomers. Hi Zoomers, sorry. Um, the Iroquois was the name that was given to these people by the Algonquin people, and the Algonquin people and these people didn't get along very well together. And so it wasn't a name chosen for themselves, and it actually means that they're snakes. <laughs> So this is a, a, a preferred name, the one that they chose for themselves, when a group of five um, tribes came together to support one another, and they chose the name people building the longhouse, not just people of the longhouse, but people building the longhouse to, to represent that community effort and togetherness. So I thought that was pretty cool. So this is our welcoming prayer this morning. So I'll say the first part, and then there's a response. Let us pray. Today we have gathered, and we see that the cycles of life continue. We have been given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and all living things. So now we bring our minds together as one, as we give greetings and thanks to each other as people. Now our minds are one. Now we turn our thoughts to the Creator, or Great Spirit and send greetings and thanks for all the gifts of creation. Everything we need to live a good life is here on this Mother Earth. And for all the love that is still around us, we gather our minds together as one and send our choicest words of greetings and thanks to the Creator. Now, now our, our minds, minds are, are one. one. Amen. Amen. And I'll hand it off to Nicole here, and we'll, we'll do the land acknowledgement a bit later at the kids' time. Well, good morning. We are a small and mighty crew this morning, so I invite you to stand up, um, and you can say a hello to one another, and we're going to join in some song. And while you are just doing a greeting, I just wanted to introduce the, the song we've done many times before, but it's a song that I think um, the message for, especially this morning when Rich is down in Grand Rapids, and... Um, just listening to a podcast this week, too, talking about how much division and polarization on issues and politics and religion there is going on, not only in the world, but in the church, that as a church community, we can just root ourselves in the belief that we do have, um, and I think the creed really speaks to that. So I invite you to join us and sing the song. And you have to sing loud because we are small. Our Father everlasting, the all-created one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus 
Jesus, our Savior. I believe in God, the Father. I believe in Christ, the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious light, forever seated high. I believe in God the Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will during that song and lost my way so thank you for everyone just continuing along that was good <laughs> the next song has kind of become our identity theme song and I think it's partly because it fits with the theme but partly because we just love it so we want to keep singing it so <laughs> hope you love it too What a grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless grace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, 
but through Christ in me. The night is dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need His power is displayed. To this I hold my shepherd. No fate I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price that has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. And he was raised to overcome the grave. To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. This Sunday is Pentecost, so we have to do some Pentecost songs. And I would invite you on this song, Breathe of Me, Breath of God. This is an, a hymnal from my, or hymn from my growing up years. But what it really um, speaks to me is that when we are um, inviting the Spirit to come, and a lot of times during blessing we'll put our hands out, or we'll put our hands up, or we'll just pray. Or I just invite you to go into the posture that is most comfortable for you when you are praying to invite the Spirit to come on you. And if you're comfortable with that, um, yeah, I invite you to join us with this song.
can be seated. Kids know what time it is now. We need all the kids at the front to help us with our land acknowledgement. I'm looking at you with the red hair. <laughs> Do you want to hold the microphone for the land acknowledgement? <laughs> All right. We've been doing this for a few weeks now, so I think we might have it down, hey? Yeah? Micah and Nathan? Yeah. We need your help. <laughs> I need your help. Yeah. So before we go to Kids Zone, the kids are going to help us with our land acknowledgement. And we're going to do our memory verse, right? Okay. So, ready to go? I'm going to start with the number seven. All right. Okay, Lauren, can you hold that? I can't, I can't do the actions at the same time. Ready? All right. There's the words. Today we acknowledge our Treaty 7 friends where the Blackfoot meet at Elbows bend. Then came the Sutina from the Beaver Clan and the Iskia Nakoda from the Mountain Lands. Last but not least, the Metis people from Region Number Three. Together, we're all treaty people here in Calgary. Awesome. And what's our memory verse? Do you remember? Walk in the way of love just as Christ loved us. Okay? Let's do it really loud. Without the mic. Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, friends, uh, we are celebrating Pentecost, which makes a lot of sense. I, mean, I don't know if I'm too loud. Um, that we are dispersed. We have about half of us are on Zoom today, and then half of us in this room, but we are all together in the Spirit, and this is going to be um, a great time of imagining, imagining what it would have been like to be in a small place and waiting on God. Um, my name is Jackie. I'm one of the pastors here at the road. If anyone here is new or on Zoom, if you're visiting us for the first time. Uh, and Pastor Rich is away. He is in Grand Rapids doing something Calvinist -y at Calvin. <laughs> I don't know. He's in Grand Rapids this weekend. <laughs> um, so we're, we are hoping he is well. Uh, but today we are going to be talking about Pentecost. Uh, my voice is a little bit funky, but if you've been here the last three weeks, it's better than it's been. <laughs> so well, this is a good news day. Um, uh, yeah, COVID took our family down for a little bit, and this is my recovering time from it. Um, but I'm going to just pray before we uh, read the scriptures. Holy God, we uh, come into this place. And we're just us. We have so much going on at all times. Um, we have busy weekends. We have weekends full of good things and, and weekends full of hard things. And we come into this place because we know that you long to meet us and we long to be met by you. So we just ask that you would open your uh, scriptures, this image, this story of fire and the story of a whole new thing, a whole new joining, and open them Open this to our hearts. I pray for each one of us that we'd each of us get a glimpse of what this could mean for our own lives. And we just pray that you would encourage our hearts, make our hearts bigger um, by your love this morning. In your beautiful and very good and very holy name, amen. Okay, I'm going to read the scriptures. 
This is what it looks like in Acts chapter 2. <laughs> and that's totally good. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues or other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem some God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each of them heard their own language being spoken. And utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We're all hearing them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? This is my favorite scripture, I think, in, this is my favorite verse, just that one, <laughs> in the whole scriptures, because I feel like it accurately describes most of what we do. <laughs> Amazed and perplexed, they asked each other, what does this mean? <laughs> okay, and also, I can't let this go by without referencing our double rainbow. Does anybody remember the early days of the internet, double rainbow guy? What does it mean? Anyways, I might link to something like that if you want to know more, I can send you it because I will think of that every time. But even if you remember that silly video, the sheer wonder of looking at something and just being like, what does this mean? It's such a human thing. So Pentecost is a fun day. It's the day where we're invited to be amazed and we're invited to be perplexed. And if I think if we come away feeling more perplexed this Sunday, we've done our Pentecost work. <laughs> and it's a day where our identity, and we're talking about identity, is revealed to be way less of what we decide and weigh more about what God is doing and what God and how God works. Uh, it's the day in our Christian calendar that we remember and we live into who we are now and we live into what God is doing now and what God's desire is now. So I was just reflecting again. I've been reflecting on this a lot lately. But we're in a world where there's 45,000 different Christian denominations, <laughs> all of them in some way, indicating that they have somehow got the grasp <laughs> on what it means to be a Christian, on what Christian identity is, how you belong. All of them, for, some, are, some are more strongly about it than others, but everyone kind of has this, like, this is, this is the boundaries of our Christian identity. This is what it means to be a Christian. And I find it really helpful when I think about that to remember this story that makes us us. This is the story of the birth of the church, <clears throat> and if we are anywhere going to find what it means to have an identity as a Christian, what it means to belong to this family of gods, it's going to be in this story. And then we're going to just start to notice what the ripple effects of this story are as we see them in the accounts and the snippets we have of the early church. So when the day of Pentecost came, that's how this starts. Now, Pentecost was not a Christian holiday. It was a Jewish holiday. It was the holiday that these disciples of Jesus would have observed, just like they all came to Jerusalem for Passover. Fifty days later, they come to Jerusalem to celebrate this holiday um, of Pentecost. And they were gathered like they would have any other year, and like thousands of other Jews were also gathered in that time. But this particular group of Jews, these Jews that had been following Jesus, they were praying, and they were waiting on God, and they were wondering, what now? And suddenly, the scriptures say. So I just want you to imagine the scene, because it helps me to imagine how crazy the scene is. So imagine your living room. Imagine your group of friends in your living room. And now imagine that the sound, like a blowing of a violent wind comes, and it fills the whole house where you are. And everyone is suddenly aware, like something is happening, but no one quite knows what it is. And then imagine fire, real fire, tongues and licks of fire come into this space and then suddenly they move to each person and they set upon each person. 
like the bush that God spoke through to Moses that lets us know when we're reading it, there's viscerally we are on holy ground. This fire is telling us something. It's burning, but it's not consuming. Every person was filled with God's spirit and began to speak in the languages of other people. And these are the acts of God. These are not the acts of the disciples. These are the acts of God. This fire and this intimate ability to speak another language and tell us something really key about the identity of God's people and about ourselves and what this Jesus stuff is about. And today we're going to just dwell on these stories and hopefully let these images of fire and languages grab our attention and grab our imagination and reshape them a little bit. So fire is a powerful metaphor and it's a powerful image for God's activity and God's work and God's presence because fire destroys and fire also renews. Fire is dangerous and deadly and can be traumatic. I have a good, good friend who uh, was the principal in Lytton last summer and fire can be traumatic. But fire is also needed for life. It's what keeps us warm. The combustion of something keeps us warm. It cooks our food. So in one context, fire is an essential part of our civilization. In another, it's very dangerous. And the ancient Hebrews told stories all the time about God and fire. <laughs> fire consumed that bush that Moses in encountered, it, but it did not destroy it. And this is how Moses knew that God was present, because of that fire. Fire led the Israelites after their exodus from Egypt through the desert. Fire and smoke are what uh, hung over Mount Sinai as Moses was receiving the law. Skip over a whole bunch, but there's lots of fire in scriptures. But skip to the New Testament, we have wild John the Baptist. And he says as he's baptizing in water, but he says someone is coming that will baptize with the Spirit and with fire. And it's here in the story about the birth of, Christian, of Christian identity, this fire. Fire which can destroy as much as it can bring life. It's powerful, and it's awe-inspiring, and it's not to be played with, and it's not to be underestimated. And it's definitely to be seen as God's holy ground. Fire is the way new life is released. Uh, the, the, the fields tell us this. The forests tell us this. We know that fires are nature's way of clearing that brush allowing seeds to be released, allowing new life to keep going so fire can be a grace. So there's this patch of land just down the hill from my house in Fish Creek, and it burned last summer. I don't, I don't know what the story is, but I just remember walking past it, smelling it first, and then noticing the ground was black and the, the trunks of the bushes, um, the bigger ones, were, were still intact, but they were all charred halfway up. And then this spring, as the snow melted, that black earth was revealed again, and it soon became the site of new grass. So this is a little picture of it, and there's a little friend in there, if you can see, little Mr. Snake. There's a lot of snakes on this hill as well. But he's in there too. Um, but this, so beyond it, you, you can see in the back, it's still all thicket and um, old, the old stuff from last year just still dead and covering and all tangled, covering the earth. But where it had been cleared out, the green grass was coming up um, first and, and quickly and thickly, Resurrected life comes from the fire. So we imagine this space on Pentecost where fire comes to us and comes among us and comes upon us. Fire that burns up the old, burns up what needs to go, and releases the new, releases the energy of a life bound up in a seed, of a life inhibited by that old thicket of past things. So here's a question for us, just even just dwelling on this image of fire. What is the new in you? What are the gifts of a new life for the world that are inside of you, your gifts, the seeds inside of you, the life that you have to offer, that have accumulated a lifetime under that underbrush? What needs to be opened by the fire that can only be opened by fire, because that's God's new life for you. And it's always at the same time God's new life for the world. So we know, let's not miss uh, the, the, the presence of fire in this place its symbolism here, and its very real effects in both crisis and opportunity. So this story about the birth of the church is about the fire, the fire that releases new life. But what happens next in this story is where we get a picture of what this new life that is released actually is and what it actually is for. What is described as the result of this fire in this room is utterly unexpected and utterly unasked for. 
and utterly an unknown country for those followers of Jesus waiting on him. It should catch our attention, it catches my attention, that as the disciples are looking for power, and they're praying, and they're discerning, and they're interceding, and they're seeking God, they get what they're looking for. They get the fire. They get this amazing and terrifying and powerful thing, but what does this fire release? Language. New to them languages, actual languages that people in the area heard and could understand. The power they receive is the power to communicate with one another. So it's, they didn't just receive a miraculous experience, but they received a miraculous ability to communicate with people that they could not communicate with them before. They didn't get power to move mountains, not this time. They didn't get power to impress or to sway or influence. They didn't get power to control anyone or power to legislate anything for anyone. They didn't get power to even make people follow them. They only got power to engage with their neighbor directly and with clarity. And there's something about language that is incredibly intimate. Language is how we see the world, right? The language you grew up speaking has shaped how you see the world. And when we enter someone else's language, we are entering into the world of another person in a really intimate way. And this is the unity, that we be joined with other people. Not that we be assimilated, but that we be joined in our differences. Uh, so there's a theologian named Willie James Jennings, uh, and he writes in his commentary on Acts, and I'm just going to be reading a lot of this work because this probably is my favorite book, and it's a commentary, which you know I'm a nerd, so that's why it's my favorite book, but this is one of the best books I've ever written, read, I mean. But this is what he says about this moment. This moment of divine power will be used to signify the full presence of the Spirit through one crucial reality and language. Here we must not draw back from what is being displayed. This is God's touching. Taking hold of a tongue and voice, mind, heart, and body. This is a joining, unprecedented, unanticipated, unwanted, yet complete joining. Those gathered in prayer as for power, they may have asked for the Holy Spirit to come, but they did not ask for this. This is real grace untamed grace. It is the grace that replaces our fantasies with power over people with God's desire for people. This is a joining, he wrote, unprecedented, unanticipated, unwanted, yet complete joining. It bears repeating that this is not what the disciples imagined or hoped would manifest. This is not what they anticipated when Jesus told them the Holy Spirit would come to enact more of him. James, uh, Jennings goes on and says, to learn a language requires submission to a people. The learner must submit to that new voice. Learning what the words mean as they're bound to a person's events, songs, sayings, jokes, practices, habits of mind, and body all within a land and a journey of people. To speak someone other's language, it requires you believe that the other person's way of being is something you can submit to and be a part of without requiring that they be like you. If you speak a language, you speak a people. You know a people and you can love a people. God speaks people fluently. And God, with all the urgency that is with the Holy Spirit, wants the disciples of his only begotten Son to speak people fluently too. And this is the beginning of the Galilean vision of God and faith and truth and the only, that only this fire of the Spirit could possibly bring about. God, not us. God is making and pressing his people who recognize the life in Jesus, who were drawn and called by his own son. God is pressing them into a new way of being. God is gesturing and opening the doors and calling people to this deepest joining possible, one flesh with God and made one with one another by the power of that fire. All these people were here. They're coming from that dias diaspora so after the, the Babylon exile, the Jewish people are spread out all over the place. But they're coming back to feast and celebrate and remember who they are. And when they begin to hear words about God, and they begin to hear words about a Savior and what they actually long for, about God's presence and glory, they're not hearing it in their own religious language. They're not hearing it in the language used in the synagogues. They're not hearing it in the language used in their church services. They didn't have church, but you know what I mean. 
They're hearing it in languages they have been speaking in their homelands and in their marketplaces and in their kitchens with their grandmas as they just do their daily work. Those languages are what they are hearing the wonders of God about within. Suddenly, you don't have to be one thing to hear and know and celebrate the living God. You can be, you can be the thing you are and celebrate the life and practices that you live out of. You can be that thing, and God comes to that place, to your most intimate identity, with a big fat yes to you, drawing you into him. So can we imagine? So we imagined ourselves in our living rooms at home, so normal, <laughs> the most normal place in your life. Imagine yourselves in your home with the wind and with the fire and what it would be like to lose that control, to lose the control of the narrative you have over your life, control of the boundaries you have about what is true and what your languages is and what you say. What would it be like to let the sacred and divine and the holy I am use us to speak someone else's language? This is a move of God and it can only be from God. I don't think we would ever think this up on our own to use the people God captivated by Jesus to push his narrative way past what they could ever ask or imagine, way past what their religion prepared them for into a new life of the spirit. Um, I, I, yeah, I was gonna, I never know if I'm actually gonna say this paragraph or not, but there, in almost every sermon there's a paragraph about this because I think it's important, but it, this just, as I'm thinking about Pentecost, I am, and it's uh, National Indigenous History Month, and this is a year, about a year since the 215 where unmarked graves were discovered in Kamloops. I will always have to say this because it's, it bears repeating. Um, we are grappling with this journey of like decolonizing and, and kind of deep brutalizing the ways our, our faith has been used to hurt other humans. And we're starting to see that, that learning what someone's language uh, can be used, like fire, can be used for good or harm. Learning some language can be used for dominating someone. And that was the exact opposite of what the church was born to do, requiring people to hate who they were born to be and leave it and disregard and become one thing. Like, it's, it's just like the exact opposite of what this church was born to do. So I think we, as Christians, it's important that we always remember and this is our time to live into what it means to be a Christian. So this is why I talk about this every time, every week. The church does not exist. We don't exist apart from this joining spirit of God, right? The traditions of the church, the institutions of the church. There's value when it serves. There's value of those things when they serve people connecting to God and each other, enabling each other to be the real site of grace. But the church does not exist to defend God, <laughs> It does not exist to somehow, through our human inventions of hierarchies and doctrines, it does not defend this living God. The church is not God's lawyer on earth, determining who is in and who is out and who is right and who is wrong, who is the most closest to truth or who is not. The church is just God's witness, just God's witness to the Spirit's fiery ability to release a whole new way of being together, being a new family, being a gathered and called group, of witnesses to what it is to be loved. And this is going to knock our socks off if we let it. It will lead us way out of the conventions of normal religion. It will lead us to be able to truly join with people who are not like us and to speak to them of God's grace and to have them speak to us about God's grace. So we gather to pray on Pentecost. Like Annie Dillard says, uh, Sometimes it's like we're tourists on a packaged tour of the absolute. We come to church, we're like, oh, that's pretty. Oh, that's nice. Oh, look at that. Very nice. But we don't anticipate that God's actually going to require very much from us. I think we like to think that he requires a lot of other people. <laughs> I know I do. <laughs> but we don't anticipate that God's going to require much from us. We don't anticipate that we're going to be truly pressed into a new shape and a new family and a new way of being in the world. But if we wait on God and if we keep remembering, remembering this Jesus life, this risen Christ that offers forgiveness and also a whole new way of being, we might be completely burned open. We might be changed. That seed might be burst open by that fire. Dillard goes on to ask, does anyone have the foggiest idea <laughs> of what sort of power we so blithely invoke? Or as I suspect, does no one believe a word of it? 
It's madness to wear ladies' velvet hats to church. We should all be wearing crash helmets. Ushers should issue life preservers and signal flares. They should lash us to our pews, for God may wake and take offense, or the waking God may draw us out to where we can never return. This Pentecost Sunday is a grace we did not want, but it is the grace that God uses to restore and redeem and call us all back from the powers of death that would destroy each other. So this is our life. As Christians, this is the call. You're going to go home today and you're going to see a pile of laundry, maybe, if you're like me, or a pile of mail that you need to sort through, or your your started grocery list, or your meal plan, and you're going to go, you're going to start home and you're going to start thinking about work tomorrow. Maybe you have something fun planned this afternoon. Maybe you'll just go home and watch TV. I don't know. And you might be like, okay, Jackie, you've said something very powerful and there's something to this story here, but what does this mean? in my normal life, in my living room, in 2022, in Calgary. And I think all we can do is just come to God with this question. Um, Grace, I know you're on Zoom, and you reminded me of this on your internet, on Facebook this week. But let's come to God. Let's encourage each other to come to God with these questions, with our, our needs. And the question that Peter and Paul and all these disciples had to ask was, what is God doing here and what is God doing now in 2022 in Calgary. Uh, Willie James Jennings says this, the same spirit that was there at the beginning, hovering and brooding in the joy of creation of the universe and of each one of us, that same spirit who knows us together and separately in our most intimate places has announced the divine intention through the sun to reach into our lives and make each of us a sight of of speaking glory. But this will require bodies that will reach across massive and real boundaries, cultural and religious and ethnic. Now love of neighbor takes on spirit dimensions. It will be love that directly builds out of the resurrected body of Jesus. It will be love that goes into the far country. This is love that cannot be tamed or controlled or planned. And once unleashed, it will drive the disciples forward into the world and drive a question into their lives. Where is the Holy Spirit taking us and into whose lives? As you go from here, as we go from here, um, my charge, my encouragement, is just to let this Pentecost thing balloon into a 3D thing for you. Don't Don't let it flatten into speaking tongues as the goal, because it wasn't. The goal was people hearing God's word in their language and joining in from their most intimate places. Nor let this be like, oh, that was just a nice thing that just started the church. (laughs) A nice thing. (laughs) It's funny how we talk about things. It's not just the story, because it's also a present reality. It's a reminder that the spirit cannot be controlled and is still at work burning new life in us. So what does this mean? Where is the Holy Spirit taking us and into whose lives is the question you need to bring to God this week? Where is God burning new life in you and where does it not feel comfortable and where does it maybe feel even dangerous, maybe feel like a crisis, maybe feel like it could consume you, but it doesn't and it won't because God never consumes like a ravenous lion. He burns so that new life can come. So where is that happening in your life now? Where are you afraid of? What are you afraid of? Where are you afraid of what is happening, especially in a loss of control? I feel like um, a loss of control, especially loss of control over what other people are doing, <laughs> is a very, very big flashing light. Into That's an invitation from God. <laughs> Almost every time where that is happening in your life, God is inviting you into hearing something and seeing something about him. The other question to prayerfully go to God and ask is, where am I being pressed into a new shape that joins with new people? Pentecost Christians are are called to lean in there. Whether you're being asked to connect with new people at work or at church or in your community, lean in there. What does that show you about yourself? What are you healing from? If you're healing from something in your past, God is, that's the spirit working at you to equip you to be in a body with other people. So ask yourself this every day. Where am I being pressed into a new shape that joins with new people? Because the spirit's not this abstract thing. It's for reaching in and making our lives, like even this group of people here, a sight 
um, of God's grace, where God's body's at work. What is being burned to make room and release this new life in you? Pentecost makes us live into God's reality, and it's going to amaze us, and it's going to perplex us. I think if you're amazed and perplexed, you are, you are in, in the discipleship zone. <laughs> I think we can practice being a bit more amazed and perplexed. But let's agree together as we gather here that let's not be afraid of being amazed or perplexed, but say yes to being God's witnesses. Redeemed and equipped and enmeshed and loving this world as fiercely as God loves it and joining with anyone whom God wants to call his. And that's going to always be, if we're reading our Bibles, it's always going to be way more people than we think and it's the sort of people we did not anticipate. So let's let God unleash his life into this world even today, even in, in our normal little lives here in Calgary and embody this good news. Okay, I'm going to pray <laughs> and then take a drink of water. <laughs> Father, I, the I am, the Holy One, the God who looks and who sounds like Jesus. Your grace is deeper than our imagination, and you give us a grace that we would never ask for. In fact, we would never even have thought of this sort of grace, but you do keep pressing us into new shapes and new places as your church and your body, and I'm not even sure I'm ready for this. I'm not ready for your coming, God. I think I, I mostly want crash helmets. Actually, I mostly just want it to be a nice experience, but that's not what you do. <laughs> but Lord, we, we know it's going to result in life and in goodness and in liberation for real people in our real city. So we ask that your Holy Spirit will come. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, amen. Friends, we're going to move into a time of communion. And uh, we do this every week. We have communion every week. And it's just this moment where we can take a beat and we can reflect and respond to the God who puts us back together. God saves what God loves, not because we deserved it, <laughs> not because we were holy, <laughs> not even close, and not because we have our doctrines right or we have a big theory of everything that we can fit everything into. We are saved because God loves and God saves and redeems what God loves. That's, that's the end, end thing. While we were sinners, Christ died for us, and that's is what we get to witness to, and this is what we trust. And that's what we enact when we come to this table and we welcome each other, and we know that we mess things up, and we're able to come in our honesty and in our need. And we're able to come even in the midst of a really broken world, and it's imperative that actually we come to the table when things feel even more broken. And it's imperative that we come in our full honesty and our full need. So let's remember that it's around these sorts of tables that the Spirit shows up and be okay with that. So my prayer is that we would just let this routine that we do every week, this rite, this ritual, let it be part of how God is pressing you into uh, that new shape he wants you to be. Because we know this is for our healing. We're thankful for this. Maybe as, as I get this ready, you can just say a, a, a prayer of thanks. Actually, I'm not going to do this yet. But we have our individual things here. But here's the scriptures that this does, that we get this from. Paul wrote this in, the, in his letter to this Corinthians. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread. Maybe it looked like this. Maybe it didn't. You can imagine. What's the bread look like at your house? Imagine that. But he took the bread. Oh. And after he had given thanks and he broke it, God, thank you for this bread. It's really good. Thank you for the people who made it, the people at Cobbs who made it. It's really good. After he gave thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after, he t after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Huh. <laughs> Friends, sorry, I just wanted to make sure I was on my right path. 
We're going to invite you to come, and we're doing things a little bit differently now as we're getting used to not COVID-ish times. We're going to start inviting everybody up to the front again for communion. And we're going to invite you um, to the front. I'll just stand over here, and I will hand you the bread, and you can take it up at the front if you need, or you can take it back to your seat and take it as you need. But I'm going to say the words now um, that we'll hear together. Come, receive the body and blood of Christ. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Eat, drink, remember, and believe that the body and blood of Jesus was given for the complete forgiveness of our sins. All right, so as the music plays, you are welcome to come up as you, um, when it's right for you. tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves my heart becomes free my shame is Thank you. Don't part, don't sing that song if you're not going to wear a crash helmet. Just saying. Um, so we are going to, we have something actually kind of a special uh, event we're going to uh, have right now, event. But we have someone we want to introduce you to. So I'm going to invite my uh, brand new friend, Selena, up <laughs> to come join me here. Um, and this is one of those opportunities we have uh, to join um, with what God is doing other places not just here. Um, so we uh, are a little church, but we do have some global connections. And this is Selena Headley. Is that how we say your last name? Yes. Um, and Selena lives in Cape Town, South Africa, and she's, where she's been there for more than a decade working. And recently she has started working with Resonate Global Missions. So you know that Rich also works for Resonate. So this is a, uh, the connection that has been made uh, through Resonate. 
But what she does for Resonate is community development, I think training leaders and doing justice work, and she's gonna tell us a bit more about that. And one of the things that Resonate, um, to, you know, to work for Resonate is, is you know, that you're plugged into the CRC, which is uh, the, the ch denomination that funds Resonate. Um, and so Selena's family lives here in town, and so we are kind of like a natural place where she can call this a home base as she works in Cape Town. So uh, we wanted, she's visiting Calgary, so we wanted to take this time to, uh, to introduce you to her. Um, now this is slightly different, just if anyone's confused, we do also, as a church, support financially um, work being done in Malawi. So this is not exactly a financial support, but just like uh, community support. Uh, and we're gonna learn and hopefully hear more about what Selena does regularly and then be able to pray for her and just be part of the people here in Calgary. Just go Selena, go <laughs> over in Cape Town. <laughs> um, and Rich wants to know, he asked me to ask if we can visit. I think just, Rich just likes to travel, so <laughs> he wants to come see it. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce you to Selena, and she's just going to say a little bit more about her work. And are you good with stuff? Well, then that too. Okay. Good morning. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, feeling a little bit emotional this morning. It's a, it is a homecoming. <laughs> I've been home for two and a half years. Um, COVID has kept me away, <laughs> and in part, and. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's a big deal. My sister, Leslin, is here with me and uh, able to see my mom uh, for the first time for a long time. And I am so grateful to the Road Church for welcoming me um, as a part of the family. Uh, this morning it feels like a kind of a homecoming. I was reminded recently it's the Lord's table and he places us at that table and opens it up. Um, so yeah, just I'm little notes so that I don't go too uh, far off base, but um, yeah, I am originally from Calgary and have really been immersed in ministry in Cape Town actually for b over 15 years now. Um, and I really have a lot of joy in working cross-culturally and collaborating and learning and teaching and building capacity with local leaders and, uh, and really as we wrestle with challenges in the community. Uh, and so I've recently taken up this position as the urban training uh, collaborative coordinator and I'll be working in South Africa but also with the churches and, and uh, organizations in West Africa as well and um, really just um, this connecting with Resonate has been a long time thing it's the relationships have been built in the field with uh, local leaders there and um, I even had a chance to be on retreat with the, the whole region before coming back um, but it's, uh, and then I met Rich three years ago because I was already starting the, the discussion about coming over to Resonate. And it's, um, so yeah, really what I'll be doing, um, the, I'm in the city of Cape Town. It's a beautiful city. May, many of you may have heard of it and seen Table Mountain as a sort of iconic picture, but there's kind of more than that to the city. Um, it's kind of built on paradoxes. There's this long history of colonialism and apartheid that has inscribed separation and division and injustice into the city. And so um, I get to, yeah, work with others to try to see God's shalom spread in the midst of that and, and those places of scars of, of centuries. Um, we're trying to sort of undo those things um, in a sense. Um, and so my work is really, you know, as I said, working with local leaders, kind of bringing people through cycles of identification, reflection, and action towards uh, fostering new ways of being in the city that kind of break down those walls, uh, fostering attentive listening to our own stories personally, the stories of our community, the stories of our city, so that we can wrestle with those histories um, with a biblical understanding of how God wants to bring us together and amplifying the good news, really by exploring how we live out our spiritual uh, in lived actions that uh, show that we're rooted in love and God's desire to bring unity. And so, yeah, my passion for ministry is just serving local leaders and seeking the well-being of the city, fostering communities of practice. Um, I've been graced by the grace of God just finished my uh, doctoral dissertation on 
in practical theology, and I'm working with the Desmond Tutu Center for Religion and Faith as well, um, doing research that is leading into that work in the community. So that's some of what I'm doing, just getting started now, sharing the vision uh, with local churches and raising support. So I'll actually be here through mid-August and looking forward to getting to know many of you, hopefully, and becoming a part of this body as I'm here. So just so grateful for your warm welcome and uh, inclusion in this space. Thank you, Jackie. We're so well, glad that you're here. We want to just pray for you really quick, and I don't know who's praying. I'm praying. Nicole's praying. That's okay. why up here. Okay, so she's praying with the mic. Okay, but yeah, can we um, pray for you? Is that okay? Can I touch you? Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Pray with me. Father God, um, thank you for uh, the table and for all of, the, of our congregation who are around the table together and being able to welcome new members to come and be around our table, God, and who are doing amazing work um, in the world. Um, and thank you so much for bringing Selena to our, our table and with her work in Cape Town. God, please be with her and bless her as she brings God's shalom to um, the people of Cape Town and that we can also support her through prayer here. Um, and like Jackie said, just cheer her on. Um, God, we also want to pray for other people who are around our table. Um, we want to think specifically of Diane Draper, who's recovering from hip surgery, uh, Wayne Smith for his continued health issues, and Aaron Hansen, who will be also having surgery on June 10th. We pray for continued healing um, for also members like Dave and Annette and Grace, God, that you are just holding them in your hands, blessing them, giving them strength, giving them peace. God, uh, when Selena said that, God, shalom, we need it here just as much um, in our daily struggles, activities, joys. God, we just pray that you are a uh, part of um, everything and in the midst of everything we do, God. And all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Selena. <laughs> so nice to hear from you. I can't wait to hear more, actually. <laughs> every week. Ooh, every week. <laughs> <laughs> Zoom, you can. Zoom installment. Um, announcements. Announcements. Gosh, yeah. thanks. We also have just a couple announcements and then one more song. I know we're starting to go over time, so we'll uh, do these quickly. Next Sunday, though, we invite you all to come. If you're on Zoom, you want to come in person, we're going to be celebrating Sammy Loomis's baptism. Um, so we'll be having a great celebration, so we invite everybody to come. There will also be <laughs> Zoom, though, so if you can't make it in person, um, Zoom will also be a great um, celebration. If you are new and you would like us to reach out, please fill out a welcome card that's on the back table. If you would like to give, there's also a basket there, or if you're also interested in online giving options, um, there's information on our website. And then just a quick reminder to parents, this is a message from the village too, that um, be respectful of um, watching your kids um, during, before and after especially, um, for making sure they're not kind of playing in the elevator or around, but we'd rather them just stay more in the event center because there's um, other people who use the building while we are here too. And a very important one is that we also really, really, really need a volunteer to help out with sound. So if that is God's talking to you, and now he really just did, please let us know we can teach you we can train you so please let Jess know if that's an area that you'd be willing to help out in and we have one more song so i invite you to stand any musicians to come on back up and uh yeah to go out with one more worship mm. belongs to our God who sits above 
Sorry. I just ended that one. All right, stay standing. Oh, I gotta look for my last piece of paper here. <laughs> All right, friends. <laughs> May the grace of God deeper than our imaginations and the strength of Christ way stronger than our need and the communion of the Holy Spirit and the fire of the Holy Spirit. Uh, guide us and sustain us today and in all our tomorrows. Amen. Amen. <laughs>